Uh, my name is Niall Maxwell uh, and from Royal Office for Architecture and uh, we put this series together for the Architecture Foundation as part of their 100 day studio and it's been a series very much uh, about talking to other practices within the rural condition whether they are based in rural locations or work predominantly within the rural context and the interesting thing that's come out of this conversation whether it be kindred spirits like Mary and Jonathan, or great thought in small things like Jan and Ryan, has been that there is a, a sort of shared empathy about the practice that each of us shares. Uh, whether it be landscape and artifact, the conversations that we enjoyed with Stephen and Graham, or last week in a rather slightly more chaotic and um, uh, active uh, performance, if you like, with David and um, Kate at their barn in Herefordshire, and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, all the way from, well, we had two conversations really with Hugh in London and obviously Neil Hobhouse at, um, at his farm at the archive for drawing matter. A really un unusual conversation, but actually what's come out of this uh, set of uh, episodes has been an ability to really explore different themes, different ideas that are close to our heart as a, as a, as a practicing um, group of individuals within, within the Welsh context and understanding that really wherever you are outside of the metropolis there are, are common themes, commonality within the way we will approach our work and the qualities that we are looking for. So the great thing about last week was that um, there was so much going on that we didn't really have a chance to cover with some of the aspects that Kate wanted to talk about and so we've invited her back and she'll be joining us later in the programme to discuss some of that uh, all the way from the barn again. And that will include her work with um, Studio in the Woods. Obviously, she was a founding member of that, along with Piers and Gianni and others. And how that has evolved, really, into a form of a collaborative um, design process, which has been converted into a teaching module, which she now runs at the Welsh School of Architecture, again, close to my heart, at Cardiff University, uh, which she runs with Gianni Botsford. Um, it's interesting, this subject really today, uh, this week because I'm interested in discussing how the countryside acts as a canvas for design, a canvas for collaboration um, and experimentation and this is quite evident really within uh, architectural learning if you examine uh, the last 40 or 50 years of practice. Uh, this for example is, is AA Design and Make down at Hook Park but actually I could have shown you a number of different slides from Harvard, Yale, across the States and other parts of the emerging architectural landscape and teaching. And this was obviously documented very nicely by Jeremy Till and others in Spatial Agency, in other books called Radical Pedagogies and other sort of um, uh, investigations into the way in which architecture can be used as a vehicle for not just teaching, but also community engagement, collaboration, and learning. And um, if we look at some of the more exemplary examples of this, for example, the Ghost Lab in Nova Scotia um, by McKay Lyons and Sweet Apple, started in the mid 90s and evolving into really a place where ideas could be uh, challenged and tested, but also practitioners as well as students could learn and develop ideas about their own work um, when returning to the metropolis. And this sits really um, alongside, I suppose, one of the most important sort of bodies of work at Royal Studio, developed by Sam Mockby in the late 80s and 90s, since really um, taken on by Andrew Freer, and um, developing into what is quite a sophisticated model of uh, embedded engagement. And I think this is maybe the paradox of tonight's conversation is, um, the, uh, the balance between a learning platform the countryside provides where you can experiment and be free to one where you are embedded within a rural community and you are delivering a certain social agenda. And that's something hopefully we'll be exploring in the next hour. But this is obviously something that is expanding across the world and has been really well documented for 30 or 40 years. This is Kero Architects um, in, his home, in his hometown working with communities to build facilities that would know, would, would, wouldn't necessarily be there if it wasn't for his expertise and his skill bring, being brought back from his teaching in Germany. 
No, I it don't I think you have your screen share on. Sorry? You don't have your screen share on. I did have it on, but it seems to have gone off. I'm really sorry. Uh, no worries. That's a problem, because I've been blathering on for ages. Let me just find out where I've gone. Would you like me to start again? No, no, I think it was okay. Don't, don't worry. Um, it was, yeah. Okay, I got as far as Royal Studio, which is all very nice, and Kerry. And then I was just talking about, again, the tension between the privilege of having this opportunity as a student and the uh, responsibility, the social responsibility we all have, I suppose, in delivering that. So tonight's guests, um, maybe two people I suppose I've been tracking for a wee while um, in, um, in, the, in the way that Mary would maybe talk about being a stalker. Uh, the first is Takeshi Haritsu, who obviously is probably better known um, to, to many of us is with his relationship with uh, Fujimori from Japan. Um, uh, Takeshi has obviously been teaching for some time now at uh, Kingston, invited to, um, Fujimori to, to come over in 2015 to work with his students. And then of course, as, as, uh, as things evolve, um, Fujimori asked him then to contribute towards his, um, his uh, exhibition within the Japanese house exhibition at the Barbican in 2017. But Takeshi's work is, is very embedded within his teaching module. But it's also something that is starting to branch out now into communities, both in London and abroad, uh, sorry, and further, further north, and where he is looking at the crafting of making, but the crafting of making through community engagement. And this is something probably that um, through research we'd understood from Fujimori's work, the way in which he empowers and um, provides ownership of architecture to an audience that isn't necessarily um, practicing. Converse to that is obviously Tom Randall Page with his giant yellow condom, one of the anti-pavilion uh, contributions from previous years. And what's interesting about Thomas is that he's also uh, teaching both in, in terms of young people and at academic level. Uh, but he comes from a sculpting background in the sense that his father is quite famous sculptor, Peter Randall Page, and it is no surprise really that he has embodied uh, much of this learning growing up in Devon in the way in which he practices, turning his hand to many different applications, really build, building a very beautiful, um, evocative, uh, spirited body of work, uh, both here in the UK, but also um, in Latvia and Russia. And hopefully we're gonna be talking about that too soon. So tonight's conversation is called Countryside as a Canvas, for obvious reasons that we have the opportunity really to understand uh, the freedom and the liberties that come with having space, having a lack of constraints, and having a different sort of set of agendas. Welcome to you both, Takeshi and Tom. Sorry for my horribly flawed start there. I'll stop sharing because I know we've got a lot of sharing to do tonight. Tom, where are you tonight? Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I'm in Devon. Um, I did under lockdown that Everything that attracts me to London, everything I love about London isn't really happening at the moment. So um, I've retreated to the countryside, um, which is a privileged thing to do, but uh, very nice. So I'm, a, I'm in rural Devon, um, staying back where I grew up, uh, where the rest of my family is uh, and my dad's studio. Great. And are you working down there at the moment or are you just sort of hold up? I, I am. Remarkably, things are carrying on almost as normal. I seem to be more busy than ever. And um, unfortunately, because it's beautiful here and I'd like to be out in it. But um, teaching has carried on as normal, uh, although obviously online, um, that's just finished. But yeah, projects seem to be carried on. And um, there's a sort of project very close to here that um, I've been snagging on, uh, which has actually been a good opportunity to be on site. Good. Takeshi, um, where do we find you tonight? Uh, my living room. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we're still doing the work from home scheme. And uh, yeah, hoping to go get back to my studio soon, which is in, based in Bermondsey. But yeah, I'm North London at the moment. When we spoke last, last week, you, you were itching to get back to your studio. I think you miss it. I um, do, I yeah. No, I don't know if you know, i based in this uh, place called Sugar House Studios, which was set up by Assemble. 
uh, in Bermondsey, and uh, it's a collection of makers, basically, it's, uh, ceramists, joiners, metal workers, uh, all sort of working in the same building, which is quite amazing setup to be part of it. So yeah, I really miss the environment. And I suppose it doesn't, it doesn't end up being the type of place to run a practice where you're surrounded by other architects, which often ends up being the case within cities. Instead, you're actually surrounded by other makers. Would that be a... Well, some of them are assembled. I mean, there are 16 of them, and they are also architects. But yeah, we, we work together sometimes, and actually working with, uh, uh, together on this uh, market regeneration project in Bermondsey um, as a joint co collaboration project. But yeah, I mean, it's a sort of mixture, basically. Yeah. Takeshi, while you um, work out how to share your screen, Tom, if I could just ask you, how, how does it work in practice for you? Are you working predominantly on your own? Or are you working with a kind of range of happy collaborators? Um, yeah, I'm kind of a solo practitioner, I suppose, but, um, but actually rarely work on my own. And, and actually, it's kind of project by project, finding the right collaborator, assembling the right team. Um, and, and yeah, so um, actually the projects I'm working on at the moment, um, one of them's on my own, and then um, one of them is in its very, very early stages. And I'm sort of working on that on my own, but it's also slightly a collaboration with my dad, which is funny. I can't imagine that's easy if it was anything like working with a sibling or a parent on anything else. So, well, we we have a remarkably good relationship actually, and uh, he, you know he takes quite a back seat and let, gives me a bit of space, which is nice. Um, yeah, well, so it's been it's been quite good. It'd be great to hear about that in, in a short time. Takeshi, we we said this week that we'd do something slightly different and and give you both a platform to maybe um, explain your position. If you could go first, that would be great. Um, sure. I'll, take, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Um, um, am I sharing the screen now with everybody? It's a uh, kind yeah. of piles of logs. Great. Yeah. So this, uh, my, I chose my because kind of first slides to, to, to this talk because this was the first day of my work. Uh, it's January 2017 after I left 6A Architects uh, to set up my own practice. Um, I, uh, this is the first thing I did, it went to the forest in West Sussex to um, hunt the chestnut logs for the legs and the ladder for this uh, tea house that Fujimori san designed um, for the Barbican's uh, Japanese house exhibition. Um, it somehow symbolizes the way we, we work that uh, uh, we starting always starting project with the materials at hand. So um, this tea house was built with uh, postgraduate students at Kingston University, where I teach with uh, my teaching partner Jim Reed. Um, we prefabricated this structure uh, in the university before we brought to to, uh, to the gallery space. And yeah, no, I was. Very fortunate to work closely with uh, Fujimori-san. Um, he came over to London three times for this Barbican show, and I learned many things from him. But I, I guess uh, from this experience, the biggest takeaway for me was the way he works with the people. Um, he was surprisingly modest, I should say, and also very generous and accommodating. And he can see everybody's strengths, and put them in a kind of a right place to make the project to happen. And uh, I think it's a way of working, that using what you have and make the most out of it. So um, in the same year, I was teaching a uh, summer construction course at Central St. Martins for the MRH students uh, with uh, my co-tutor, Greg Ross and Carlotta Novello. Um, uh, we designed this uh, uh, outside bread open structure um, and built together with uh, 26 students, uh, all prefabricated in the workshop, in the university's workshop in King's Cross. Takeshi, are you, um, are you, have you moved on from the first slide? Because we are still on the logs. What? Can we just see whether we can move it on? It might just be technology that's letting us down. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. 
missed a few strides then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So that's the that's the log we yeah. used, and that's the prefabrication in the university. Fujimori san with me, and uh, that's the Central Saint Martins, the bread oven. That's where we are now. So that was in King's Cross. We prefabricated uh, in summer, and then brought to the site uh, in autumn, which was in Coniston in Lake District. So this was the uh, joint project with Grisdale Arts and the University of Arts London uh, to reactivate this outside space around John Ruskin Museum and the Coniston Institute um, through making and building. So, um, for example, we charred the roofing board on site, which is much easier thing to do, obviously, in the countryside than King's Cross. Um, but also the it's a sort of an idea of a building as an event, so that to support people together uh, and uh, making a kind of a big spectacle using this traditional Japanese charting technique to, to basically help uh, uh, to engage with local people. We also uh, made this uh, information kiosk, also prefabricated in uh, off-site, and then installed on-site which is clad in this uh, decorated copper shingles. Um, we devised this uh, very simple tool uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, decorative pattern on, uh, on the copper sheet uh, to, to emboss this kind of a uh, pattern on it. And I gave that tool to, to the local school kids in Coniston and uh, they made their own uh, artwork Onto the onto the copper uh, sheet, and that's been implemented into the permanent structure. So it's really this kind of a idea that uh, uh, building as a social act. So I think this is the sort of powerful thing about architecture that if we can bring the uh, the people together. So um, and also this idea that the building is actually quite simple thing compared to say computer or car manufacturing, uh, everybody can actually make it. Um, so it is about sort of creating opportunities to get people involved in the process of making. So um, on the kind of based on this rural condition theme, uh, our collaboration with Grisel Arts expanded to Japan. Uh, this is the last summer. Uh, we launched this uh, architecture and design school uh, in the rural village in Yamagata Prefecture. And uh, we built this uh, bee house uh, together with 14 international participants and uh, staff members, including photographer uh, Motoko Fujita, the artist Andreas Tanad from Ireland, and Adam Sutherland, the director of Grazer Arts. Um, I also took my 70 year old son Asa with me as an assistant, who's next to me. Um, the rural village in Japan faced this issue of uh, uh, declining population and aging. And many houses are left empty. And if it's not looked after, it crumbles down very, very quickly. Um, so our project is about searching for an alternative way to revitalize the aging community by bringing foreign students to look at the place with outsider's view we may be able to find uh, ways to use resources available there and uh, in order to create a sustainable economy that mutually beneficial to both locals and visitors. So the first thing we did was to harvest materials from, uh, for our construction uh, by demolishing the old house, recycling mud from all the, uh, of the wall, or the reclaiming the clay tiles, roofing tiles. We also went to mountain, chop bamboos, and learned the technique, uh, how to split bamboo from the villages. So the school is about uh, not only building, but a lot about correcting materials and how to treat them. So I think in this way, we can learn and directly engage with the landscape and understand 
the place's geographical and cultural, social, and economic situation. So, yeah, this is uh, uh, with the oil in the bamboo to prevent from rotting. And of course, it is about sensual and tactile experiences. The coolness and softness of mud under your feet is something unforgettable and it sticks to you for the rest of your life. And being it outdoor, obviously, and uh, close to nature. So it reminds you that uh, the world is not for humans only, but also bugs and animals. We invited master craftsman, uh, the plasterer from a nearby town, uh, to teach us the practical skills of how to make traditional open dog wall construction using the split bamboo lath. And also we learned uh, uh, traditional Japanese carpentry at first hand um, because we were literally surrounded by the examples. The, the whole village became a almost construction textbook in that sense. We were also fascinated by um, not only the traditional way of building, but also this kind of a contemporary and in some way ordinary way of building things. And that uh, directly influenced the, the way our building was put together. So this is the completed bee house from the front. Um, the rural condition allows us to have a certain freedom, like uh, breaking the traffic code like that for uh, various pragmatic reasons. And it was very interesting to uh, see how the local people's kind of a perception to us changed during the stay. Um, as the building went up, the village, the people from village took us seriously. Um, I think it's just a building so visible and uh, big in some way that uh, you can't ignore it. And uh, that is also another, in some way, very simple statement, but a power of architecture, I would say, that, uh, that changes people's mind and attitude in a positive way. Um, so yeah, this is my last slide of my presentation that, uh, uh, this is the valley that we are working. It's abundant rice paddy fields. Uh, and uh, well, the idea is to go back there uh, every summer. Unfortunately, this summer was canceled, but we are looking at going back on spring and summer next year uh, to slowly uh, develop the, this uh, land into productive bee garden uh, over the course of 10 years. That's the sort of the time frame we set. Um, so, yeah, that's the um, end of my presentation. Thanks. Um, what's interesting is when we talked about this last week, you, you made it um, obviously clear to me that you, you don't practice in Japan. You're, you know, obviously your, your, your work is in the UK. Um, where do you see the value in the international exchange, given that you, you haven't lived in Japan since 93, is that right? That's right, yes, yeah. No, you're right, yeah. I rediscovered my own country being here for away for such a long time. I became a very, basically, outsider, the stranger to my own country. Um, and I said to you before that, you know, I wasn't interested at all the traditional Japanese construction. I wouldn't work for timber buildings. When I was in Japan, I was looking at European architectures and so kind of, a, I came to England because of that. You know, I was fascinated by archigrams and the English sort of architecture scene. But anyway, so yeah, I just dis discovered the, my country and it, it's actually quite interesting that the positioning yourself to, always in the kind of outside that uh, looking at things that uh, somehow, I don't know, reveals things that the people won't necessarily notice because you are too sort of familiar with. That's the idea of this sort of international exchange school works. I think that the, all the kind of foreign students can see the values that that local people cannot see. Well, it's funny because we, in previous episodes, when we've spoken to Jauma 
about working in Switzerland or Ryan about being from Chicago, but really embedding himself in, in Dublin and, and Ireland. But this, this other kind of set of eyes that you develop to look at the, at the context in which you're working, I find really interesting. But the most, most sort of uh, fascinated with is Fujimori himself, because obviously he never really left Japan until really the last decade or so when he's been commissioned for, for various things abroad. Um, he always seems to sit as a very unusual figure within the Japanese architectural scene. Can you maybe describe his role or his importance within Japan? Well, he, he's a very important figure in, in Japanese architecture scene. Um, but I guess his position is different because he was a historian until age of 43 or something. Um, uh, so he wasn't architect. Um, so I think that's the kind of a set differently. I mean, he consciously set himself differently. He declared that I'm not, I will never do modernism, for example. Um, uh, so yeah, it's quite interesting that, you know, sort of putting himself in position to that. Um, it also might explain a lot about the way he approaches his, his take on architecture, because he's very good at fusing historic reference with you know, uh, different craft practice and then obviously adapting it to contemporary needs. Mm, yes, yeah. No, he, he has a vast knowledge of uh, architecture all around the world. So uh, he, his frame of reference is just uh, phenomenal. I think that's also another factor that his architecture is kind of, a, yeah, sort of a very unusual in a sense. Mm. Yeah. You can't really pinpoint what it is. Tom, can I bring you in here? Because what's interesting I love the work that you're producing is that I can't, I can't sort of pin you down for a start because you seem to be interested in lots of different things. And I wonder whether that's um, partly to do with your upbringing, partly to do with the way in which you are maybe not approaching your work in a formal architectural way. Would that be a, a, f a fair assessment? Yeah. I think so. I think, um, although, you know, I'm trained as an architect, um, I, I always, I think I was always kind of a maker. I was always interested in how things put together. Um, and so loads of my work, I think, comes from a very kind of material, very craft. I mean, craft sounds um, romantic. It's not really that. It's about how you put stuff together. Um, and a fascination with that, whether it's inflatables and plastic or or kind of earth or or, or stone um, or timber loads and loads of timber work um, and I guess growing up in the countryside I mean I grew up in a house which is made of earth with a thatched roof and thought that was totally normal um, and and again like getting that distance to, to see that that's maybe not so normal and also my playground as a child was my dad's studio um, and I would push myself around on a um, pallet truck and, um, and, and had kind of just loads of materials there at my disposal and people were always busy lifting stuff and changing the shape of things and um, generally crafting stuff. So I think that had a huge formative kind of impact um, that I think has carried on into the way that I approach a project. Mm. Um, Takeshi, could you, could you stop sharing your screen so we can maybe get Tom to, to share his, because it might be a good time to maybe expand on that, Tom? Yes. Uh, but Takeshi, what, your education was quite formal and you described that, you know, in Japan, obviously, uh, it's quite a kind of, quite a tight structure into the way in which the education model is delivered. Uh, what do you mean tight? Well, I mean in the sense that uh, the types of freedoms that you've been describing in practice, uh, are they available within the teaching uh, environment within J Japan? Or is that something that really you've just uh, been able to embrace since working in the UK? Do you, sorry, I don't quite understand your question. You mean the kind of a building stuff with students and stuff like that? Yeah, that or more the, the formal language of teaching, sort of the, the, the code of what is right and wrong or how you approach design. And whereas in fact, what you seem to be generating within either the international exchange or within your work at Kingston is a, is a much freer way to interpret how to approach the design process? Uh, I 
don't know, to be honest, what the uh, architectural education now days like in Japan. Uh, uh, I know lots of sort of hands-on education is also going on as a trend. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I suppose the, there are certain freedoms um, in, in this country compared to that. I mean, I would say especially sort of a workshop was uh, something liberating for me. You never get that sort of a facilities in the Japanese architecture department. Uh, you know, I was, I was loving it, welding the steel in the AA Ching's yard. You know, just, that never happens in, in Japan. So that was, I suppose, the kind of a underlining principle that I took on that, you know, why we have these facilities, why don't you use it as a kind of a main tool for the education. But that's all, all my, only my take. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, Tom, do you want to take it away? Because this looks fascinating, what you've got to show us. Sure. Have you got the um, Baba Yaga's hut? Yeah. Um, so uh, this, I chose this image to start with. This is actually an image taken in um, Umia in Sweden. Um, one way or another, more by chance than by design, I think I've ended up doing a lot of stuff in the north and Eastern Europe as well. And um, so this is, and they're all kind of wood cultures, I suppose. And I wanted to use this to talk about trying to understand, trying to get understand, trying to get under the skin of kind of what the material building culture is of a place. And all of those places that I've spoken about, sort of Sweden, Finland, where I studied architectural carpentry, and Russia and Latvia, where I've taught, um, they're, all, they're all places where I suppose the default position of the landscape is forest. Um, and um, I think in this country, we, we think about forest as being something protected and uh, a thing unto itself, whereas there it is the, it is the, um, the blank canvas is forest. And so the first thing you do is kind of clear a space to build something and what you fell becomes your material and becomes your site. And so this building kind of represents that for me where there's kind of minimal cuts made. There's no planking involved. Um, each, each log is liftable by two people and then four trees are found in a square, um, felled halfway up and used as the foundation to lift up the building. So um, is this moving forward okay? Uh, we, we're still on the first slide, but we're now moving forward. That's great. Um, so this is in Russia. Um, uh, felling students, felling uh, trees with our students and just kind of realizing that this is just really in Russia and, and thinning the forest, taking out young birch trees. So this is a summer school that we ran in um, Nikola Lenovitz in this extraordinary art park um, about a couple of hours outside of Moscow. And um, the first project I'm going to talk about is called Sliced White and yeah we started by just going to the forest, felling trees, small trees and bringing them back with Dajavita who's the kind of right-hand man of Nikolai Poliski, who set up this whole um, massive art park. Um, so this whole project was basically an ode to wood, um, whether it be the kind of thinnings here of the forest, or here we, we, we had the um, use of a, of a um, sawmill in the village. And I think it was, it was this way of designing with a group of students where you're kind of on site and in the landscape, sort of hunter gathering, kind of foraging for materials, for details, trying to understand how the place is made. Um, and we went to the village sawmill and I found a board that was only kind of 10 mil thick and very wide. And we found a huge log there and just kind of exploring how when you've got a tool like a sawmill at your disposal, you can kind of do things that wouldn't normally be done, uh, like enormous very, very thin boards. Um, I was also really struck in, in Takeshi's uh, presentation just how many similarities there were between uh, working in rural Japan and, and working here in rural Russia, and how almost every one of his pictures I could find a kind of equivalent um, <laughs> version in Russia. So this was the final kind of brisole structure that we built for an outdoor classroom um, uh, in, in Nikola Lenovitz's um, art park. During that um, project, um, 
Alexander Brodsky was one of our visiting um, lecturers, and and then in in the photo there with him is um, Robert Mull and 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 Zenia who, who who lives at the art park and um, teaches as well. And um, Alexander Brodsky was um, yeah he was kind of visiting critic for us, and he's got several pieces of um, architecture pieces of work in the art park, including this one on the right here, which is um, Villa Pio Two. And we were really interested in looking at um, his kind of hunter-gathering, foraging of materials. And um, this, this villa is made from these very ubiquitous industrial Soviet fencing panels made in, in um, prefabricated concrete. Um, and there was something about the way that he uh, values these very pragmatic um, ways of that, that, that are things are built in the countryside that it's almost kind of like an art povera kind of way of working um so um yeah he, he became like a, a real kind of ally in these in these russian projects um and his his critique was invaluable and then this is the the, the next project we built also in in in, in rural russia in the same art park um, again started with a kind of foraging for materials much like Takeshi kind of you know reconditioning the the, the roofing panels this this project's clad in um panels of barbecues that are discarded um by tourists coming from Moscow to the art park they're kind of used for a couple of days and then left to rust and we found these everywhere and collected them and then kind of catalogued the pieces and built up a language of cladding out of those. And, and again, it's like, this is just a kind of way of working that would be completely impossible um, to do at a distance or from an office in advance of being on site. Um, similarly, this detail kind of emerged um, part way through the process of building where we, we cut a new doorway into a log house um sort of just chainsawed out the logs and as those logs kind of rolled out we thought oh those are those are interesting let's incorporate one of those so one of these logs becomes reused as a kind of seat in the um glorified porch that we built for this new building so that's the that's the sort of entrance cut through the old burnt out in fact it's, a, it's an old uh, banya an old kind of bathhouse that uh, had a fire and um, is going to be repurposed as an archive and education space. And we were building the kind of first elements of this and signifying that back to the village. And then I think it's working in these very rural places, they, the relationship that you build um, become really, really, really important. And so this is Ajivita, who I showed you earlier, dragging up the the little saplings from the forest and this was us with our students <clears throat> invited to his house to sample his samagon which is this lethal kind of um, homemade alcohol that he distills and then imbues with all sorts of herbs and things from the local area um, and then so this is moving forward from from the russia projects which are all done with the global free unit um, uh, this is moving on to uh, the projects in Latvia, um, which in fact we ran a we ran a uh, sort of unit at this summer school for I think for seven years. Um, me and my teaching partners, um, and this is uh, when we we were converting an old ice house into a sauna for um for a, a kind of house of culture, and how we we kind of put the word out that we needed a, a stove, and you know then in, in two days time suddenly these guys turn up with a, a stove that they've made from a an old an old water heater and and it, it seemed like things almost happened by magic when you started to build up lasting relationships with the place and the people um so this is that stove installed in the in the finished bathhouse um and these bucket showers at the end of the structure um this was the first project we built the story tower 
uh, in a uh, square by the station. Uh, and it was a kind of dialogue about uh, people coming and going, mainly going from these rural towns. Um, and it became, it, this was a, a book exchange where people could leave books on their way out um, and, and pick them up on their way in or, or vice versa. Um, and um, this project really grew from a kind of uh, chance encounter with a big roll of um, damaged Tetra Pak uh, that we started experimenting with and kind of using ways that things are built in that place, shingles, metal shingles in particular, and then transposing them into different materials, perhaps new materials, or in this case, a kind of recycled material. And again, the, the, the use of like many hands um, and incredibly repetitive tasks. So God knows how many thousand hand folded paper shingles did we make for this one. But it was still being used kind of, I think it was one of the projects that really, um, proved to us that this kind of thing could work and could actually have social impact because uh, 10 years on they were rebuilding that or replanning that square and actually looking at um, how they could make this permanent with a permanent cladding. So uh, it kind of really changed their way of viewing that space. Um, again, this is the start or, or early on in another project in Latvia, in the same town, Seisis in, in rural Latvia. We came across this kind of huge pile of, we didn't know what, these kind of rusty, dirty bits of plastic and rubber. They turned out to be the dampers from a railway line that was taken up. Um, so we started collecting them and looking at how we could use them, what kind of aesthetic languages we could get from cladding with these rusty things. And here we are kind of experimenting with making um, cladding panels that would open up as kind of wings on this a wilderness observatory that we designed. Um, so all of these follow the same kind of similar kind of format. They're a two week summer school, normally a week of kind of intensive kind of research and foraging for, for details and materials um, and then designing and then a week of really full on building. I'll see if I can um, just share and see, see if I can show you an opening GIF of that. Um, can you see that? We see your, we, we see the, oh yeah, it's just opening, flapping you down. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad with your rural broadband to be able to, <laughs> man, well done. Ambitious. Yeah. So uh, go back to the images, hang on. Share screen. I'm more ambitious than fortnight ago, I can promise you, it's fine. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, that's an inside view and that's a view. Then this, um, this is talking about, you know, I suppose those, those events and those uh, moments of giving these things back. We're always trying to very wary to try not to litter um, and to try to make things of tangible value to the communities that we build them in. Um, and small communities, I think it's easier to do this kind of thing, which is you know, we, we um, as part of the summer school, we held an event uh, where we tried to make soup for the whole village and got everyone to bring vegetables and have this huge cauldron and kind of the mayor came and blessed the soup. And, um, and these were kind of events where you could give the structures back um, and try to instill some kind of ownership. And we felt like the acid test was always, if you went back the following year and your thing had not, fallen into ruin but had actually been repaired in your in your absence which did happen um, sometimes and sometimes it failed as well um, Tom can I can I stop you at this point because I know you're, you're going to show us in a minute so if you come off that and maybe we can look at that um, separately because sure. I think it's a it's a good opportunity maybe just to expand the conversation into this this challenge really, I mean, obviously both of you are talking about really uh, a fairly indulgent, slow paced craft, crafting of architecture, which is very possible, I suppose, when you're doing it a, 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 in this, um, in this time frame, because both whether you're in Japan, Takeshi, within the, the platform of that exchange program, or whether you're in Latvia or Russia, you're, you're delivering a particular, um, outcome it doesn't it's like a test isn't it it's not necessarily a, a true brief in the sense um do you think 
how, how does that how, how do you reconcile that with within you know it, within how you measure the outcomes for it because on one level it's about allowing students and people to learn but on the other you're actually contributing or offering something to a community that don't know you and you're having to work to sort of develop a relationship with them through the architecture or through the intervention. Takeshi, maybe could you maybe respond to that first? Yes, yeah, so it's a really important point that you, you, you're raising that uh, the reason why we going back there is precisely because of that. We want to see how the bee house is being used, what's any problems, any defects, any anything that we can improve so that they kind of build up the relationship with the villagers the, the, who are the users. Um, the also, yeah, so this is a kind of a, the, the way that perhaps the architecture can stretch so for kind of a, yeah, 10 years is a sort of a notional timeline that we set, but uh, it's sort of a more kind of incremental development rather than just sort of a design, build, like hand it over, that's it. So it's more, yeah, kind of, in some way, this going back is the most important part rather than what we build there. That's interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that like, um, yeah, it's that feedback loop. It's, it's, it's seeing how it's accepted or not accepted or how it's used or reinterpreted. Um, is something that you really never get as a student with your projects all the way through is to see them used. Um, and it's, I think it's super valuable. And, and I think, yeah, the longer that you can um, establish a relationship with a place and the people, the better. I think that the, the summer school that we did in Latvia, it used to move every year from, um, from town to town. And after we got involved, um, we kind of hit upon one place where we had a good relationship with the mayor and, and we would we're like, why are we going somewhere else every year? Let's stick it out and build on this. Yeah, and it's about relationships of trust at the end of the day, isn't it? You're trying to build that and then of course from that you get a critical mass which allows you to do more maybe rather than less each year. Is mm. that, mm. that the case? Takeshi, do you see, um, you obviously talked about in your presentation that obviously in some of these parts of rural Japan, there really is a hollowing out of young people. What do you think this uh, injection of activity means to the very rural remote communities that you're working in? Uh, I hope it's a positive thing. I mean, they are very excited to see young people. I mean, they don't get to see the young faces often to, to begin with, but also by creating this kind of an international exchange platform that attracts many local young people like we had a workshop with local university students they get involved helping us split the bamboos because we needed more hands so by setting up lots of sort of uh, yeah young people coming back which is uh, really really vital for the community Kate can I bring you in at this point because I, I know that back in the 90s you and Takeshi met each other in a swamp in Japan is that right <laughs> Um, yes, I believe I, I'd forgotten it was swamp-like, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got very muddy, don't you remember? <laughs> I do. You were both studying the AA at the time, is that right? Um, I was studying at the AA um, in Shin Egashira's unit, and it was a workshop organised by Shin Egashira um, in Japan. And were you a student at the time, Takeshi? Uh, yeah, I was there. And, and Kate. Obviously, you're brought into the conversation because last week we were discussing, but didn't really get very far, given the nature of last week's um, talk, that um, obviously you're, you were one of the founders of Studio in the Woods. Could you maybe just describe, partly to, to, for the audience's benefit, the, the whole process in which that came about? Well, it was started really by Piers Taylor, who um, phoned up his mates one day and said, I'm fed up with doing paper architecture why don't we all get together in the woodland that I live in and build something for a weekend, mine and build something. And um, I was working for Janny Botsford at the time and we both thought, how could you possibly do anything useful in two days? I mean, I think we both have a very slow working process and so the idea of designing and building something in two days seemed ludicrous and that you wouldn't be able to do anything interesting or effective. 
Um, but Piers is very persuasive and um, he, and, and so we went along and the idea is that we were provided with a pallet of uh, sort of builders, merchants, materials and um, given a group of about 10 people to work with and that we just would do something. Um, and actually, Jenny and I, um, what we did that weekend has not only kind of led to um, a way of uh, of kind of investigating place that neither of us had ever discovered before that we call constructive analysis. But it also, um, I think, well, now we're teaching together um, 15 years on or something, um, where we're actually trying to implement and kind of extend the thinking behind what we did in those first two days. And, and what we did at that first workshop was to delineate um, a cloud of sunlight that was coming through a canopy of, in this woodland. Um, with pieces of sticks and string, um, which had come from Builders Merchant. Um, and it was a very place specific piece of analysis that could, having been constructed, could be kind of inhabited, um, created a kind of memory of an experience that was fleeting, made something that was sort of normally invisible, visible. And I think for those of us that took part in this exercise, engaged us in this place in a way that we absolutely wouldn't have had we just been sitting there for 24 hours. And um, so I think there's some just, you know, the opportunities that are available to you when you build something anywhere, it doesn't have to be in a rural environment, but um, it engages you with a place in a way that is absolutely kind of vital for us to experience as architects, I think. Tom, do you, do you find that with the people that come on the on the residencies that you work on in, in Russia and Latvia? Yeah, I mean, I think they can just be the most incredibly intense learning experiences, workshops like that. Um, very, very, very immersive. And I mean, I hear so many people talk about Shin's uh, landscape workshops in Japan as having been kind of moments of complete change in their career path or, or trajectory. Um, I hope that, I, and I think that ours have been similar for many students, and many, many students I'm still in touch with. Um, but do you think, do you think, uh, I mean, obviously, Kate, you're describing a two day workshop, it's incredibly intense, whereas what you're doing in Russia and Latvia was, was much, much longer, wasn't it, in terms of an immersive process? Yeah, I mean, I think they are, you know, they're, they're, they're a different kind of thing. I don't think Studio in the Woods has the same. You know, it, it doesn't have uh, the intention in relation to sort of a client or kind of social thing often. It's often on, on private land and, and we're doing something much more public. Um, and therefore, I think our things need to last to some degree uh, and they need to be of a certain kind of finish um, just uh, in order to be genuinely something you can kind of hand over at the end to a, a, a village or a town. Um, Kate, how did, how did Studio in the Woods evolve into the teaching uh, model? Because obviously you do get out of the woods and start to, you know, for example, I've talked with you in Leominster where, where your students were obviously dealing with a number of different sort of interventions within the, the townscape. How, how, did, how has the, um, the Studio in the Woods informed the way in which you practice? Uh, in, well, um, sorry, you educate? Yeah. Initially, I would say um, when I first started teaching at Cardiff, I was teaching on my own and I had a kind of focus on material and its connection to place and making was a kind of key component of, of what I got the students to do. I got them to make a kind of large, um, I described it as sort of one to one fragment um, as a way of exploring a thesis through understanding the connection between a material and a place. and um, Lempster is a small um, agricultural um, town with about 11,000 people in the Welsh marshes and um, its agricultural heritage is very strong. I think it's still the um, highest, uh, it's still the kind of largest source of income for the area, but um, it's also got nine steel fabricating um, factories of some kind, pressing steel, um, steel frame making, uh, flashings, pressing, all sorts of steel fabrication that's grown out of this agricultural heritage where farmers started to diversify and 
build sheds. And I find that really fascinating. So, and that grew out of Studio in the Woods because at one point we started using the material of the place that we were working in. So it started off with builder's merchant palette, but then quickly evolved to being timber of that place. Um, and, and then when I started teaching with Jani, we were looking really at the kind of way that we um, analyze something physically through this process of constructed analysis. And that's taken um, the focus of the unit into a, into a different and very interesting direction, uh, where now we're looking more closely at sort of how architecture evolves from climate and how you experience climate through building a kind of, um, through kind of analysing it, um, through making something. Takeshi, your, your, um, your, your practice is, is, is sort of interwoven, I know, very much with your, your teaching. Um, is there any form of separation there or is it always going to be the way in which one informs the other or one provides you with a purpose for the other? Because somewhere like Grisdale is, 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 is very much like almost, it feels with the way you described it, like a joint venture between the academic and the, and, and, and the community. Um, is, that, is that a fair reflection? Uh, yes, I th think so. Yeah, the Grisdale commissions are, Strange ones, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's, it's more more collaboration, more organic. It's quite uh, unpredictable uh, collaborations. In fact, we we are pro collaborating now with the practice architecture and some Islam from material culture for the. Hopefully, there's a summer workshop happening in Coniston in late August, beginning of September, uh, in a similar format. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so that's sort of a special. I I also run the small. Uh, practice, the more sort of, I suppose, straightforward, ordinary architectural practice dealing with uh, uh, public uh, buildings as well as uh, private residential buildings as well. So, I don't know, but uh, in some way that, you know, this kind of a oscillation between teaching, research, and what happens on the practice is always sort of a uh, uh, concurrent and uh, it's always corresponding. So. There's no separation as such in, in some way that, you know, the conversation we had in the office is directly influences to the, what I tell the students next day or the, what happens in the university, bring back to the, uh, to the office, vice versa, so. Yeah, Tom, I can't imagine with you that really there isn't any form of separation. Similarly, you, you, you seem like you're, you're, you're constantly sort of plucking at different, different apples on the tree. Would that be, would that be right? Yeah. I think that they, they, they definitely feed one another and there have been moments of, of actual overlap. I mean, there's a project a couple of years ago that we designed over the course of a whole year with students at Oxford Brooks, um, which was for a real client, which um, hopefully will go on site soon. Um, but yeah, um, I think what, I don't know, I, there's a sort of freedom, I think, in teaching and in workshop environments which it's really hard to find in normal practice i think normally because the budgets don't allow for that kind of uh experimentation and the and the clients aren't willing to have this unknown you know that degree of unknown in the in their brief um I suppose that's, what I, that's partly why I was interested in, I, I think I described it slightly, slightly indulgent, you know, the idea that you're you know, working your way through disposed barbecues, it's sort of something that you can't measure in, in, in cost that way, can you? Because you wouldn't, wouldn't have to do that in, within the conventions of practice. Therefore, it becomes a different type of exercise, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it certainly doesn't fit into any kind of contract that I would know, you know, um, that kind of, these kind of formats, things that involve contracts feel like an irrelevance in that context. Do you think um, this is more reflective maybe of the way in which you were brought up or you, the way in which you work? Because I thought maybe a good time, so we're going to run out of time here. Have you, have you finished maybe by sharing the art barn with us? Because it's rather a yeah, sure. project. It might help to just understand a few things really in terms of the, the relationships that one forms when one's making, which can't be defined through the yeah. process. This, yeah, exactly. This is a project which is very, very unique. I mean, uh, 
it's for my dad, it's his new studio. Um, and it was an opportunity to basically work with the, the, his, his sort of assistants and the craftspeople he's built relationships with over the past 30 years here um, as contractors. I mean, I say contractors when there was zero contracts involved in this project. It's the conversion of a agricultural building. Um, and this is working with um, a really fantastic um, stonewaller who um, we, we literally went, again, sort of foraging to local disused quarries to try and buy spoil from the most local places we could. And he, um, he came and picked stones one by one and it felt like something from a kind of previous era to work in this way um, and it is you know it's a huge luxury um, but it's also I mean that said it's, it's also sort of um, incredibly valuable um, and, and I think you can create in a way that and you, and you sort of you make details you design in a way in dialogue with the craftspeople um, often kind of working literally on site um, to design stuff and, and, and it feels like there's a kind of dialogue there which isn't facilitated very often in contemporary architecture and the way it's produced um, where there's a kind of feedback where you can ask how would you do that or see something on site happening um, and, and it kind of gives you an idea for the way that something might join. So these are two examples of kind of connection details, which I think are only possible really to generate in that way. Uh, and then just to end on a couple of images of the, the almost, almost finished barn, which I'm still kind of snagging, endless snagging process on. Um, but it's really a project that's kind of crafted and every single, there's hardly any items in it which are kind of off the peg. You know, all the glazing's kind of made at the local, steel fab placed and galvanized up the road um so yeah i think that's sort of it's it's the way that i would love to work more if only there were opportunity um i'm sure many people would but i think i think it's also a reflection of maybe the the culture of working rurally you know we touched on this i think when we spoke before that i love the story you told me about the only reason you got the stonemason was because the contractors went bust on Castle Drogo when they were restoring it. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. We're actually using the same stone that Castle Drogo's built from. Um, there's a, there's uh, a claim like that. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the rural context, you know, all these relationships are, you know, like we were saying with the, with the place, with the workshops, they're built over a long period of time. And um, the reason why contracts aren't really necessary in this kind of project is because the contracts are all to do with reputation. They're all to do with knowing that person. Um, and if they, did, if they did a runner or they did a terrible job, it would get back pretty quick because it's so local. Um, well, that's, that's almost perfect, medieval. That's a perfect way to, to end the programme, I think, Tom. Thanks for the a cl classic anecdote from the rural condition. Uh, we've run out of time for this week. Um, we haven't got um, one plan for a fortnight, but we are working on it at the moment. If you've got any ideas for, what you, um, for people you'd like us to be talking with, please, by all means, message me on social media or get in contact with the Architecture Foundation. Just leaves me to thank Takeshi. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. Thank you. That's great. And uh, to Addison, Rosie, and Will back at Royal Office for sorting all of this out. Thanks very much. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.